Hello and welcome to Monkeys with Fire. You join me tonight for another special guest interview, and this evening I'll be joined by Ben Douglas, designer and founder of Ritual Casting. If you're brand new to the channel, click the heart to follow the live Twitch stream weeknights Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7 pm. Also, be sure to subscribe and tap the bell icon to receive notifications from YouTube for the latest videos and updates. And now, on with the show. Right then, so it is my pleasure to welcome Ben Douglas of Ritual Casting onto Monkeys with Fire. And good evening, Ben. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Very well. How are you, sir? Yeah, not bad, thanks. Yeah, doing all right. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Good to be here. Okay, so we've, we've got a, a very active chat that I'm sure will have plenty of questions for you uh, during the course of this evening. When you are creating a character, is there a story behind the character? Do you go to that sort of level of detail? And then if so, yeah. what, what's, her, <laughs> what's hers? Um, I, I always add, the thing is what makes characters characters is they've got a story. Um, and I always try and make a story for each character. It's not always obvious at first, but sometimes I find the details along the way as I'm actually sculpting the character. Um, in the case of Felicia, I, I love Westerns. Um, I love the trappings of Westerns. I love the, uh, the, the sort of myth of the gun sort of thing. You know, the sort of uh, the lawless uh, sort of aspect of, um, of, of Westerns in general. And the sort of mythic side that kind of comes along with it, um, but also steampunk is always good fun as well because you can throw in kind of crazy elements such as you know, sort of mechanical arms and clockwork bits and pieces, um, and you can kind of push that that sort of grounded realism of westerns into a bit more of a sort of fantastical kind of uh, uh, kind of direction. Um, so Felicia. Uh, the reason it's called a, a gambit of guns is because uh, in her world, um, there's much like we have the Olympics. Um, it's almost sort of like a, a hyper, uh, sort of like a, can't remember the right term for it now, but it's sort of almost taking uh, the idea of uh, gunslingers um, and taking them from sort of the sort of legendary hero status and almost elevating to more like a sportsman kind right. of status. Um, where there's a competition called uh, a gambit of uh, the gambit of guns, which is a yearly, uh, sorry, a, a bi-yearly competition, uh, almost a bit like, uh, say, any like UFC or MMA, that kind of thing. Um, the main difference is it's all focused around the mastery of the gun, and uh, every year the contestants will. Uh, spend, you know, uh, sorry, every other year they'll spend a couple of years practicing and uh, nailing their trick shots and all that sort of thing. And then they will go through rounds of competition where they are trying to do ever more um, uh, sort of insane things with guns, trick shots and, you know, sort of like move, you know, moving targets over ridiculously long distances, all that kind of thing. Um, and the idea is that through each competition, the uh, the participants get whittled down until there's one remaining, and that one then has to go into a uh, an actual live fire uh, shootout with the previous champion in order to take their title. So uh, yeah, you don't tend to get people who are veterans <laughs> of the gambit of guns. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so the idea is there's always, you know, your sort of typical, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of old line up at the end in the streets, several paces outwards, you know, and that is the, the culmination of the Gambit of Guns. And uh, Felicia is uh, hoping to enter it. <laughs> right. Okay. And that's, that's pretty much her story. And, and so do you sort of sit down and write all, all, all of this out before, you know... Uh... Before you even uh, no. get started, <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, I'm not that organised. Um, <laughs> it's it's something which usually sort of comes along uh, as a rough idea, so I can kind of sketch something, um, 
you know, sort of get the idea of the character. So obviously I wanted a bit of cockiness to her, um, a bit of uh, maybe maybe overconfidence, perhaps. Um, so that kind of, you know, sort of lent to the pose where, you know, she's firing over her shoulder and, um, you know, her stance is totally off for shooting something. But, you know, she's showing off, she's getting her flair. Um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to feed that into, uh, into account. So I kind of think of things to sort of uh, influence the character and then it gets more refined as I'm, you know, so like, yeah, as I'm actually you know, sketching pendants onto the side of the gun and it's like, yeah, you know, maybe this is the gun that her father gave her and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's, um, you kind of think of reasons as to why you're doing something. <laughs> Right. Okay. Let's let's take a look at another character then. Okay. So, do you want to introduce her? Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is Gunhilt, the uh, the she wolf of the white wastes. Um, I was on a bit of a, a Viking kick <laughs> at the time, um, and uh, I I still think she's probably one of my favourite sculpts so far. I I love her pose. Um, but yeah. So so Gunhilt, um, she is a uh, a legendary warrior on the battlefield um named the she-wolf because of her uh, her ferocity in battle um she uh she's kind of not strictly viking i guess it's more of the viking inspired um sort of setting that was actually from one of my D D campaigns um you had an area which was called the uh, the white wastes and it was essentially a gigantic battleground which kind of sat in between the territories of um of five clans um and gunhild was the the leader of the the wolf clan and essentially her legend spread as she kind of rose through the ranks and um a bit maybe a tiny bit like lagatha from from vikings you probably see there's a little bit of an inspiration there <laughs> um managed to sort of uh, rise to the the top and uh, took over command of the uh, the wolf clan, and um, she is legendary on the battlefield for uh, uh, unorthodox tactics and uh, sort of pretty much being being able to sort of guarantee victory for her warriors. And uh, the idea was is that once once she'd actually secured victory for her warriors and sort of united the clan, she just kind of left and. Uh, kind of went off on her own adventures to see the rest of the world and uh, see what sort of adventures and uh, excitement that she could get up to. All right, let's let's go and take a look at another character. So when you when you see all of these artists painting up characters that you've created, I mean, how does that make you feel? What what, what you know? What's uh... it's awesome. Honestly, it's so it's it's really kind of. I don't know, it's I guess it's sort of validating in a way. Um in a way that no no artist is ever going to be happy with their work. Um so when I when I finish a model, uh I I kind of think, ah, I'm happy with that. And then I come back the next day and I see all the mistakes. Um and you know, I'm sort of like, oh, I could have done that better, I don't like the position of the arm. Uh, the way that the uh, the cloth drapes there doesn't you know doesn't work great, but then when you you kind of see people where it's just a case of um, you know they they spend hours of their life <laughs> um, either print, printing this and painting this, and it's really validating um, when you spend you know so much time working on something and because you're sort of uh you know neurosis and Im imposter syndrome is definitely a, a real thing uh starts to kick in and you've got these people who are spending you know like pascal spending hours upon hours upon hours re rendering you know metal on a part of your model which to be honest you probably you know i probably forgot i even sculpted that bit and it feels amazing it's absolutely fantastic like it doesn't matter what the skill level of the painter is. The fact that someone's taking that much time uh, and effort to, you know, to work on something that I made, um, 
it, it never gets old. It's it makes it like worth it. <laughs> it's it's an amazing feeling. I absolutely love it. It's always super exciting when someone tags me in a post on Instagram. And uh yeah, it's um it's super brilliant. Excellent. So do you want to introduce this character? Uh Katsumi, also known as uh Cunning Shadow. Um yeah, so I think this I could probably chalk up a, a lot of my uh, sort of success to Katsumi, I think. Um, it seems there are a lot of fans of, uh, sort of Japanese iconography <laughs> around. Um, and she quickly became one of my most popular models at the time. As soon as I dropped the uh, the concept art for her, it was like, yeah, you know, landslide voting. Um, and I think this was kind of the model where I really upped my game when it came to the detail. So with the kimono, with all the, the floral patterns on there. Um, it was technically difficult because it was the first time that I'd done it. And it was also the first model I did where sort of the, the safer work version and not safer work version was actually quite different. Um, whereas the, the safer work version has the, the sort of chest wrap. So obviously you get a, a bit of lift and squeeze in the, the sort of chesticle reason, uh, region. Um, and of course, obviously, when on the not safe for work version, that's that's not there. So, yeah, so I ended up with sort of like two versions of the body to work with. Um, and yeah, it's the main thing was to essentially give a surface detail. I think I just got the the Ronin, uh, the Ronin Geralt figure uh, from CD Projekt store. And he had this sort of beautiful floral pattern to the uh, to the clothing, and you know it it didn't need to be painted. It's just you know it's it was sort of like a sort of metallic-y kind of paint to kind of look like silk, and I wanted to sort of replicate that. Um, so that's what I did with Katsumi on this one. Um, and I know some people are gonna be like, it's it's crazy. Some people are going to be insane enough to try and paint the the floral bands. And so they're never meant to be painted. <laughs> they're just they're just surface detail. Um, if if a one sixth scale statue can get away with uh, with um, not painting it at that scale, then yeah, I think anyone can get away with not painting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, when it's um, when it comes to Katsumi herself, the the idea was uh, I wanted to do. Um, uh, obviously, more of a an Asian character because I do like to, you know, sort of uh, change things up when it comes to races and uh, sort of body types and stuff. So I went with sort of a more slight figure, but more like an athletic build. Um, and from there, it's more a case of I wanted to sort of do this sort of samurai or, you know, sort of Japanese warrior kind of character and. I sort of bounced between doing the whole sort of, you know, in the in the the armor and you know the helmet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I really liked the idea of her sort of preparing, um, you know, preparing her her gear essentially. And I kind of came up with the idea of making her more of a like a demon huntress. You know, maybe she doesn't have armor. Maybe she relies on these sort of um, uh, sort of spiritual. Uh, sort of charms and stuff around her to to act as her armor. Um, so she has got a lot of charms around her. Um, she has uh, obviously some hanging uh, from her headdress, but there's also some which uh, hang from like little tabs uh, across her chest and such like that, uh, or just underneath the chest around her her obi. Um, and they act as wards. And it's her duty to uh, to sort of stalk the shadows and, and hunt the demons that would otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise cause cause harm to mortals of the world. So it's a, a fairly simple story overall for Katsumi. Uh, nice. It's most case of wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so it, I should point out that uh, the Simeon Collective are, of course, going to be working on sculpts from ritual casting over the next uh weeks i guess uh so it will be snickson who is going to be working on katsumi so exclamation snickson if you're not already following him uh go and click that link go and give him a follow 
Uh, his work is absolutely stunning. I can't wait to see what he does with this character. Is he up for the challenge of painting that kimono? <laughs> we will find out. <laughs> okay, would you like to introduce her then? Uh, yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, it's Private Saskia Willows, I think her second name was. Um, yeah, she... Um, she is a, a private in the uh, Unicorp mechanized uh, mechanized division, and uh, she is responsible for making repairs and uh, working on the mechs uh, that are sort of uh, manufactured and deployed by Unicor uh, to, yeah, essentially fight other people's wars. And uh, I, it was sort of. I knew I wanted to do an elf kind of character, but I also didn't want to do stereotypical uh, fantasy. Um, so I decided I would make her uh, sort of like a futuristic elf, <laughs> where right. you have elves and, and orcs and things, a bit sort of warhammery, I guess. Um, but I just loved the idea of a, an elf um, with a gigantic wrench who works on, on mechs. And uh, yeah, she, she works for Unicorp, who uh you know pretty much the uh the world's sort of or the universe's sort of uh weapons manufacturers and uh she works on yeah uh, essentially repairing um scrapping salvaging and uh tuning up up mechs wherever they're necessary and uh yeah that's kind of her job okay. <laughs> originally the the idea is actually from a, a sketch that i did uh, of actually the same character only i did make her a, a an actual mech pilot and i kind of had an idea of doing a series of characters who were all sort of for all intents and purposes fantasy characters but in a sci-fi setting and they all had different jobs uh whereas saskia was going to be a pilot but um then i just kind of i love the idea of having a, a giant wrench on a on an elf because they're not usually depicted as strong characters so yeah so i kind of did that as a bit of fun <laughs> and um this is actually probably my easiest sculpt that I've done, I think. Um, the I'd, I was learning more cloth simulation, and uh, I pretty much made all of her all of her jumpsuits and uh, everything else sort of in in Marvelous Designer, and I made a jumpsuit, and it fits, and it actually worked properly. Um, and I'd used sort of elasticated fittings in the software to kind of get the the deformation where I wanted it to, and yeah, she was a dream to work on. She was really easy to go together, like chopping her into parts for uh, for getting ready to print. Yeah, really easy to to work with, and uh, I think that's probably why she remains one of my favourite characters because she was just easy to work on. <laughs> okay, uh, so again, this uh, model is going to be worked on by a member of the Simeon Collective, and that is Sarah. So exclamation, Sarah. Uh, you'll want to be following her Instagram channel. Uh, she'll be posting up her work in progress pics. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what she does with this character. It'll be a lot of fun. And Sarah has a unique style, so I'm sure uh, she'll bring some of that to, to uh, her painting on this one. Okay, then. And so <laughs> finally... Uh, we have uh, Sarissa, the uh, the succubus queen, and her unfortunate thrall who has reached the end of his usefulness. <laughs> um, so Sarissa was very much, uh, I think, one of the first three concepts, maybe the, one of the first second set of concepts, perhaps. Um, right back when I first started, I think she was my second second model so i've just got all my models up above me so i'm just trying to remember what order i printed them in um yeah i think she was like my second model um she uh it was a case of when i first started i'd basically spent a, a weekend uh doing sketches um like i just did four sketches i was like okay right i'm i'm launching patreon um getting all this stuff together before the end of the month and i think i had like a weekend left um so i did some sketches and we had um uh i think it was like an earlier version of the ritual uh we had sarissa on there i think there was i think it's when i actually had four options and one of the four options was um 
uh, I think it was Jasmine, I think. It was sort of a, a pirate kind of themed one. Um, but she never got any votes because, to be honest, it was, wasn't a great design. Um, there was the last one I threw together. Um, and the other one was Saskia, I think. Um, so Sarissa won the vote because, you know, succubus. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you need any other reason, yeah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to be honest, when, uh, when I was coming up with the first set of concepts, they, they weren't the, you know, sort of sort of level of thought that went uh, went into them as I tend to do now. They don't didn't tend to have like that much of a story or background to them. Um, at the time, it was very much a case of uh, I'm doing pinups. I need a succubus because long legs, big butt, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so it kind of fit the idea of pinups, and I thought, well, okay, fancy fancy pinup, the quintessential fancy pinup is a succubus. So I did that, and um, yeah, so. The thing was, though, I didn't want, I, I sort of didn't want to just do the sort of uh, sexy succubus pose. I kind of wanted to sort of show a succubus for sort of what she is, um, you know, a, a demon after the, uh, the the life force of uh, of mortal beings. So I wanted to sort of depict her as the, the actual title of this is called Cruel Lust. Um, and I think that's kind of where I sort of went with it. So I, I made sure that the, um, you know, she wasn't just, uh, you know, in a sexy pose, um, but she was actually, you know, essentially dominating, you know, a very uh, sad looking figure uh, and just using, using them for their, uh, their sort of vitals. Um, and so I kind of ran with that and it's kind of where we went. <laughs> And I still haven't done a secondary figure in a model since Sarissa, actually, so I may have to change that at some point. Right. Um, okay. So that was kind of my first foray into trying to do a sort of interaction between two figures in a model. And cutting that up was difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, trying to, trying to decide where the cut points were going to be. It, was, uh, it wasn't particularly easy. Um, but we got there in the end. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yes, so Pascal is going to be uh, painting uh, Sarissa up in uh, in due course. He obviously got nice. a busy a busy uh, <laughs> workflow already. Um, He's going to be tired of my models. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think that's going to happen <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so yes, if you are not already following Pascal, it is exclamation Pascal. Uh, of course, you'll be able to see what he is doing with uh, Grunhild already. Uh, so do keep up to date with him there on uh, Twitch and on Instagram. I'm sure everybody here knows all about 3D printing and uh, STL files and et cetera, et cetera. But do you want to just sort of go through for anybody who isn't uh, aware of just how do you how do you get hold of one of your characters? So uh, for anybody who has a 3D printer... Um... When it comes to FDM printers, the uh, the one the uh, sort of melting filament sort, uh, I don't own one, so I have no idea how well my models work with those. They're not designed for it. But if you have a uh, a resin printer, so like an Elegoo Mars or any Cubic Photon, they're silly cheap now. Um, overall, like two hundred quid will get you a a good quality three D printer. Um, you can head to my website. You can uh, purchase um, an STL file. You can purchase any of the uh, the models that are currently up there. Uh, the models on my site are essentially the previous month's models from Patreon. Um, if you want the best value, then you can join Patreon, um, which will essentially get you the, the bust version of the character, the main statue version, any Patreon exclusive options, um, all the extra bonus pieces, uh, renders, work in progress shots, um, and you can vote on the next model as well. Uh, and you can get that for, I think it's $10. Um, I don't know what it is in pounds. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, $10 a month for that. And you get the get access to the STLs at the start of the month. And uh, you can vote on the next one. And uh, I am starting to produce uh, my own physical uh, models now. Um, so I do have merchants in the US and in the rest of the UK, uh, so you can have a look at uh, the merchants page if you wish to buy a print. 
Um, a lot of my merchants, uh, like Nerd Heights Minis, uh, Dammit Daniel, um, who is in chat, I think. Hey, Dan. Um, they offer smaller scale versions uh, for those not ready to take on a, a 10 scale model yet. Um, so yeah, you can purchase those uh, physical models from them. Um, if you want uh, 10 scale models, uh, I will be producing physical prints myself within the next, uh, uh, probably within the next week. I just need to finalize the, um, essentially the checkout process for that and get all the shipping details all marked in. Um, so you will be able to buy physical prints uh, from my site as well. What, what, so what 3D printers would you recommend? Uh, is there any that uh, people should be aware of or can look out for? It's kind of, a, it's an interesting thing right now is um, 3D, uh, 3D printers are sort of, sort of, I guess, leveling up uh, sort of towards the end of this year. Um, monochrome screens have become a thing. Um, the way the 3D printer actually works in terms of a resin 3D printer is um, you do supports for the model and you, you slice it and it essentially divides the model up into uh, almost like an MRI scan. Um, but it's a black and white image mask. And um, in the printer itself, the print, uh, print bit gets lowered into the vat. There's a LCD screen underneath it. The black and white image gets displayed on the screen. Uh, the white white image uh, essentially is where the light comes through. There's a UV light underneath it, uh, which then cures the resin. And the uh, the print bed then lifts up, comes back down again. It does the next next slice of the image. Um, and so I kind of forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So being so, you only need black and white to sort of display images for 3D printing. Um, the typical LCDs are from like mobile phones. Um, so they actually have the RGB, RGB filters in them as well. Now that actually proves to be an interference for the UV light passing through it. Uh, so the new screens are monochrome. So they've only got you know black or white. Um, they're either on or off. So uh, it allows light to get through it much more efficiently. So print times are reduced by like uh, down to like 30% of what they originally were or something like that. So instead of seven, seven to 12 seconds per layer, you're looking at one to two seconds per layer. So it speeds up printing, um, but they're still pretty new on the market. Uh, not entirely easy to get right now, especially replacement screens. Um, my advice would be to sort of wait, I suppose, because um, that's going to become the standard. Uh, but I still think resin kind of needs to catch up a bit. Uh, but if you're looking to buy a printer now, then the Elegoo Mars Pro, I think it's around about 200, 230 quid, 250 quid. And that will get you a, a really reliable, easy to use printer with you know, a good 2K screen with cheap, easy to find parts and a hell of a big sort of community around it as well. Um, so whether it's an, an Elegoo Mars or a Anycubic Photon, um those are probably the best options to go for if you're looking for something right now otherwise i'd wait for the the monochrome screen versions to come out right ah so there we go fx is just saying that he's printing on an eligu mars so okay yep. excellent yeah I've got, I've got one myself as well along with my uh my shuffles as well so and honestly quality wise they're more or less identical so I believe you are running a competition uh, on your Patreon. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? I'm um, indeed, yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, I'm running essentially a uh, a year. Well, essentially, it's like a year's anniversary. I'm a couple of couple of weeks late, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been busy. Um, essentially, a year's anniversary sort of celebration of starting Patreon. Um, I've, I'm trying to do a charity drive more than anything. Um, it's actually a, uh, um, a painting competition and all proceeds are going towards charity. Uh, there are prizes, a, um, uh, an Elegoo Mars is actually up for grabs, uh, with first place, um, along with, uh, some Amera Labs resin, um, which, uh, for, yeah, thankfully. Uh, Amera Labs actually 
sponsored me for, which is great. Otherwise, all the other prizes are coming out of my my own pocket. Um, the the Mars, the um, there's ritual casting merchandise. They so can get a, a a mug or a t-shirt or, or both if you win first place, um, as well as uh, STL files. And um, it's running until the end of November. Uh, the idea is is that to enter, you make a donation uh, with the donation link in my my Patreon post, um, which I'll post up in a bit if you like. Sure, sure. Um, you make a donation. You send me an email along with uh, decent quality photos uh, of your paint job of one of my characters, which can't be scaled down any lower than 65% uh, of its original scale. Um, and from there, it goes into a, a public voting once the competition closes. And yeah, you either win one of the prizes or one of the runner-up prizes or, you know, uh, mentions or anything like that. We'll, I'll probably stream the results because uh, it might be a bit of fun. Um, but you can vote for your favorite, uh, your favorite entries. And the donations are going to be going to a charity called Direct Relief. Um, this year apparently has been a record setter in terms of disasters. And Direct Relief was a charity I spent, well, I spent about three hours researching charities. Uh, and Direct Relief used 99.4% of all of its funding uh, on its projects, um, which provide uh, search and rescue and, and care for people who have had their homes destroyed by earthquakes and natural disasters and you know, wildfires um, and out of control gender reveals. Um, and uh, essentially, they, they do really good work. And it's only going to get worse with uh, with climate change, I imagine. So I thought it a very worthy charity to to donate to. Um, and that's where the money's going to be going, 100% of it. Um, I'm just hoping that I can actually uh, get more donations made than the amount of money I've spent on prizes. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. And so everybody, if you obviously, if you've got a... Uh, uh, one of Ben's uh, sculpts, and you absolutely should be putting in a donation for the charity. Put forward uh, your uh, your work, and just you know talk about the charity and 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 on on your social media. Let's you know let's get the the, the word out there. Yes, as a community, we can do wonders. Yeah, it's the the competition's open to anybody. It's not just open to patrons. The um, the merchandise is a patron. Uh, patron exclusive price so um you, you, even if you're like a patron at like a dollar or something um yeah as long as you're a patron you can you can get all the prizes the uh first prize is an elegant mars a liter of amerilabs uh, resin um either gray or black it's your choice um as well as a ritual casting t-shirt and mug and also an stl file uh, second place is basically the same but without the mars um, and you can choose a T-shirt or a mug, um, and you've got the liter of resin. And third place is uh, half a liter of the resin, um, a T-shirt or a mug, and STL file. Fantastic. So, and I'm sure I'll probably throw together some, you know, runner-up prizes as well. So, <laughs> once it gets closer to the time. So, a, a lot of fun and for a worthy cause as well, which is great. Yeah, it's. Um, it's it's been great because the the Twitch community has been absolutely fantastic. It's uh, I owe a lot to the Twitch community. Um, e even even sort of inbreds like Damn It Daniel. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's been absolutely fantastic seeing the Twitch community kind of um, you know just sharing all my stuff. And it's largely thanks to them that I am now known about because Patreon hides me because my stuff classes is not safe for work. Um, so I don't get any anybody stumbling over my stuff on Patreon um, unless they're looking for me. Uh, so having having them sort of show my stuff has been absolutely fantastic. And the amount of support that I've seen the community give to other community members uh, and other charities as well uh, is kind of what inspired me to sort of do the charity in the first place. So uh, that's... It's pretty much something I really wanted to do to, to kind of, you know, give back something. Right then, I think we'll we'll bring this to an end. So 
Uh, ben, thank you so, so much for your time this evening. It's been uh, really interesting to learn all about the characters that you create as ritual casting. It's been awesome. It's it's always fun to hang out and, and uh, talk shop with people. It's a lot of fun. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much. As I say, we will be uh, painting your sculpts, myself and the Simeon Collective, over the next uh, couple of weeks. Cheers, guys. It's always fun. And, um, yeah, it's it's super humbling that so many people are taking an interest in, in the uh, the polygons I push around. There we go, everybody. So our thanks to Ben from Ritual Casting for tonight's interview. That was a lot of fun. I learned a lot tonight. I uh, I didn't realise just how much goes into these character designs, but it really does show when you have one in front of you. All right, everybody. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening. But until then, bye for now. <laughs>